Hello, my name is Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Husseini Manji, who is the Global Therapeutic Head of Neuroscience at Janssen Research and Development, one of the Johnson & Johnson pharmaceutical companies. Dr. Manji is also a visiting professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Duke University School of Medicine. He is a leading expert in major depressive disorders and is here to discuss some of the new research in the field of treatment. Dr. Manji, welcome to The Therapy Show. I'm Dr. Nash. Thank you for the kind invitation to participate. And it's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you and your audience about the very important area of major depressive disorder. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that led to your research in the field of major depressive disorders? Yeah, thanks. I'd be happy to. I always had a fascination about the brain and the mind, even during undergraduate work in biochemistry and certainly during medical school as well. But initially, I wasn't completely sure where the science was going what we could do to help people suffering with some of these conditions, etc. And it was actually during medical school where some professors went to a medical school on the west coast of Canada at University of British Columbia. It was during medical school that some of my professors took a strong interest and arranged for me to really get tours of research labs to see what was going on in the field. And then certainly when I was doing my clinical rotations during medical school, I saw firsthand, unfortunately, the impact mental illnesses have on people, their families, sometimes how much they suffer, the lack of understanding. And it really motivated me to try and you know, move into this field. And if I could, really try and do something to make a difference. And so then I went into a psychiatry residency training. And after my psychiatry residency training, I moved to the National Institutes of Health where I undertook additional fellowship training in molecular and cellular biology to really try and understand at a molecular and cellular level what might be going on in some of these conditions in order to come up with improved treatments. I had initially thought I would be at the NIH for a couple of years for fellowship training and then go back to university. I ended up staying there for 15 years. And there I was the chief of something called a laboratory of molecular pathophysiology. And we started a new program called the Mood and Anxiety Disorders Program, which is the largest program of its kind in the world. And we really try to, and I was the director of that program, and we really try to see if we could come up with better ways of understanding and treating some of the major mood and anxiety disorders. And I stayed at the NIH for a number of years before I was recruited to J&J with the idea that some of the scientific advances had progressed to a point where we could now start to think about converting some of those scientific advances into treatments and cures. And I'd like to believe we're on the verge of doing some of that. So that's a bit of my background. So how would you briefly explain major depressive disorder to a non-professional? I think that's actually a very important question because I think any one of us, we've had our bad days and we've had sort of Monday morning blahs or if you know something hasn't worked out, we feel down. And I think one of the most important things I try to explain to professionals is that major depressive disorder is not the blahs that all of us go through at different points in our life. This is a distinct illness that has different signs and symptoms that I can walk through in a moment. It really is a clinical condition that can't just be willed away. You don't just try harder. And just like if you had diabetes, you couldn't just will your pancreas to secrete more insulin. This is a clinical condition that needs some sort of intervention. Now, the intervention could be medication, it could be psychological, could be behavioral, etc. But that's one of the things I try to emphasize to people. I do think that it's also important to know that like most conditions, you can sometimes have a range of severities. So sometimes I might use the analogy to say hypertension. If you've got mild hypertension, you might generally be okay. You just see that your blood pressure is elevated and with diet and exercise, you can control it. And as long as you keep it under control, you know, you don't have any major problems. Same sort of thing with diabetes. You could have mild diabetes and not have any major ramification that you controlled, etc. It's kind of the same thing with major depressive disorder. Some people will be unfortunately very impaired and some people will be struggling 
but can get by. But I think that's one of the things that we really need to emphasize to people because there's not a blood test for it. Sometimes if people are struggling, they're sort of forcing themselves to get through the day, they manage to get through the day, and then they crash on the weekends, and then they start the same thing next week, you might almost think that, well, it's, it's within my own control. But what you don't realize is that you're actually using so much effort to get through that this illness is actually taking a toll on you. So you've got to recognize it's an illness. It has different signs and symptoms that I can come back to and realize that like any illness, it can benefit from treatment. So I I think what's also important for people to realize is that depression or major depressive disorder almost certainly isn't just one condition. Again, coming back to the other medical examples, we think that major depressive disorder arises from the combination of multiple genes and then multiple stresses and psychological factors. And so it shows up in different people in different ways. So if you go to the something called the DSM-5, the classification manual, you can see the criteria that include depressed mood, But it's interesting, some people don't necessarily feel that they're depressed. They just have lost interest or pleasure or motivation in everything. But if you ask them, are you depressed? They won't necessarily say, yes, I'm depressed. So even depressed mood doesn't have to be present. But you could, as I said, often have diminished interest or pleasure in things. Often there is change in appetite and weight. But once again, some people have no appetite and lose weight. On the other hand, some people eat too much and gain weight. You can have changes in sleep, once again, in both directions. Some people are excessively revved up and they simply keep ruminating and they can't fall asleep or stay asleep. Some people, and we think especially sometimes younger depressed patients, are often more slowed down and sleep too much. Many people are tired, things that would normally they could accomplish. Now they find themselves fatigued very early on. Difficulty concentrating, paying attention is a big part of it. And then unfortunately, many people will sometimes have thoughts of death or sometimes even suicidal thoughts. And obviously that's something we need to pay a lot of attention to. One of the things that's also important to keep in mind is we're all human beings and if there is a major impact event in our lives, becoming somewhat depressed is almost a normal reaction. So if you lose someone, someone passes away that you care about, the grief and mourning is almost a normal manifestation of that. But you need to distinguish that from a clinical syndrome of depression. And one of the ways we try and think about that is by looking at the context, are you having these symptoms in reaction to something that's happened? And then even if there's a context, is the intensity excessive? So say someone passed away and you're feeling very depressed about it, but if you're really racked by guilt, I should have done this, or this is something I could have prevented, etc., then it might suggest that even though the death of the person was a trigger, you're now starting to move into a clinical depression. And similarly, the duration. So if something bad happened and two weeks later you're depressed, that's still within the realm of understandable. This is just a consequence to the event. Whereas two months later, it might suggest that the event has tripped you over, if you will, into a clinical depression. I think one of the other things that's also important for people to realize, and this is something we'd really try and educate the healthcare professionals, is that similar to what I said, sometimes people don't show up saying, I'm depressed. Sometimes they'll show up indicating that they're tired all the time, they're having sleep problems. Because the brain basically affects the whole body, it's not unusual to have many physical symptoms. So you could have headaches, you could have GI disturbance, you could have different kinds of pain, etc. So I think that's something else for people to realize that sometimes even these physical symptoms could be a manifestation of depression. And just because someone doesn't say, I'm depressed, you still need to be thinking about depression. So that's one of the challenges as well, is that depression, major depressive disorder, sometimes shows up with mainly physical symptoms, and you need to be very thoughtful about recognizing that this could be depression, 
so that you can provide the correct treatment. Can you explain episode and mood? Sure. So I think what we again realize is that many illnesses can sometimes have what we sometimes would call discrete episodes. So you might have an episode of depression that, again, on average might last something like six to nine months and then hopefully come out of it. But then there's different paths you could go down. If you're one of the very fortunate people who has only some of the genes or you have not that many stresses, etc., And you might be one of those fortunate people who after you have this initial episode, you might be fine for a long time. And then perhaps sometime down the road, have another episode, which could happen out of the blue or it could happen in the face of a trigger. Sometimes there are different triggers. So for example, in women, sometimes the postpartum period can even be a trigger. So sometimes in women, that's a particularly sensitive period. So you could have some of these biological triggers that could trigger a recurrence. A recurrence needs to be distinguished from something we call a relapse. A relapse is more like where you were getting better, but you weren't completely well and you went downhill again, either because you stopped the treatment or the treatment lost its effect, et cetera. And again, one way this might be a totally simplification of what really happens. And if you can think about you getting an infection, if you start the antibiotics, two or three days later, you might be better. If you stop the antibiotic too soon, the infection may come back. Whereas you stay for the course of the antibiotics, then you think you've wiped out the infection altogether. Then you're hopefully free of the infection until you might have an infection down the road. The term mood, again, it's not an exact definition, but we think about it as a way in which we look at the world. So mood basically colors our outlook on the world, ourselves, our relationships, our self-worth, etc. And so that's one of the reasons why we often will tell someone when they're in a depression to really put off making any major life decisions because it's sometimes surprising to people just how much your mood can influence the way you look at the world. So, for example, I've had people who, for example, might have been depressed and were struggling in school and were thinking about just dropping out of school, simply can't do this. And generally speaking, what we might try and recommend is not necessarily doing that, certainly perhaps taking time away from school if it's trying to get better and then looking at do you want to continue school or not. Similarly, some types of work where when you're not depressed, the work might seem okay. When you're in the middle of a depression, it seems overwhelming and stressful and you start to have these negative thoughts. I simply can't do this, etc. So mood is something that overlays everything about you, your view of the world, your view of yourself. And so it's very important not to make any major life decisions while you're in the middle of a depression, because you may find that once your depression is treated, you might actually be fine at school or you might be fine at work. And it might have been a shame if you made the decision in the middle of it. Can you discuss some of the current treatments for major depressive disorder? So there's an, a range of treatments for major depressive disorder. And the major classes of treatment would include psychological interventions and medication interventions. There's also some procedures, and some procedures would include things like electroconvulsive therapy, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Probably the two biggest ones are the psychological and the medication. And generally speaking, we think for most people, a combination of the psychological and the medication is the best approach. And again, in coming back to my previous analogy, Unfortunately, someone who has type 2 diabetes, you might need medication to get the diabetes under control. But then if you do sort of follow the diet and the exercise, it'll help keep things under control. So that's kind of how we think about this as well, that medications and psychological interventions can work hand in hand. Sometimes if the depression isn't severe enough, the psychological interventions alone 
may be um, sufficient, and there's different kinds of psychological interventions, probably something called CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy has the most evidence behind it in terms of helping to help people with their depression. There's other kinds of psychotherapy that includes, you know, something called interpersonal therapy or family therapy, depending on, you know, certain stresses, etc. So some people, unfortunately, just the depression itself prevents them from really being able to get the most out of the psychological therapies. And so we definitely recommend medication for those people. And I think one of my hopes is that even by helping speak to your audience with the show, we can help remove any stigma about medication. None of us would like to have medications. None of us would like to have any illness. And yes, it's, it's just a part of life that unfortunately we all have some illness, we all need some medication. And so there's absolutely nothing wrong with taking medication to help you with the illness. It's not a crutch, it's not a band-aid, it's something that's treating an illness. So there are these family of antidepressants we use, most of the time partly based on the type of depression someone has. And based on perhaps some of the side effects that medication have, you would choose your medication. You might also pay attention to if the person has previously been depressed and responded to a specific medication, you might try that again. Or if they've had a family member who has been depressed and responded to a treatment, there's some evidence to suggest that these treatment response runs in families. So the biggest class of medications are the medications we call SSRIs, and the term is an abbreviation for serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. And that's a technical term to say that what we think these medications do is that the way the brain seems to work is that you have one nerve cell that talks to the next nerve cell by releasing some chemicals. So the nerve cell A would release a chemical and one chemical is serotonin. The serotonin would be released into almost a gap between one nerve cell and the next. It's called a synapse. And then the serotonin chemical would talk to the next nerve cell and send its message. So what these SSRIs do is they make your own serotonin hang around longer. So what normally happens is that one nerve cell releases serotonin. It sort of does its job in terms of talking to the next nerve cell. And then the first nerve cell quickly sucks it back in so it can reuse it later. What these SSRIs do is that they keep the serotonin in the synapse longer so you kind of get a bigger bang for your buck. And so there's about five different SSRIs that are all effective and work for some people or others. That's one class of medications. The second class of medications would fall into a class of what we would consider norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. So just like serotonin, norepinephrine is another medication, and increasing its fat seems to help in depression. And there's another neurotransmitter or chemical called dopamine, that's another one. So sometimes we think that if people have a depression where they're more anxious and more agitated and maybe have panic attacks, etc., then the SSRIs might be a better type of treatment for them. It sort of dampens things a little bit. On the other hand, if someone has a depression that is more where they're slowed down and they don't have any motivation or they don't have any drive, then medications that work on the norepinephrine system or Wellbutrin is another one. Maybe that is a better class of medication. I think it's important to say there's also older medications, some medications called tricyclic antidepressants or something called monoamine oxidase inhibitors that also work very well they tend to have a few more side effects. And so generally people don't start with them. But if the current treatment doesn't work, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. We also use some other things. And lithium is a good example. So lithium is a very well-studied and extensively used treatment for bipolar disorder. 
what used to be called manic depressive illness, but it's also very effective as what we call an antidepressant potentiating agent. So if someone's been treated with an antidepressant and they've responded but not well enough, for many patients, when you add lithium at even a low dose, it sort of boosts the antidepressant effect and they get better. So there's different kinds of treatments, as I said, that you could be used. And what we often find is that a combination. So one formula is often to get people's depression better sooner with medication. And then once the depression is better, then try to also implement some of these psychologic interventions to help people remain well. I think one of the important considerations is also how long you treat. So we have some rough guidelines, but like most things, you need to tailor things to the individual person. So usually, if this is your first depressive episode, the general guideline is that once people have gotten better, you still continue treatment for another six to nine months. And it's somewhat analogous to the example I mentioned of having an infection. If you have an infection and you're getting better with an antibiotic and you stop it too soon, the infection might come back. And we think the same sort of thing happens in depression, even though someone might be well. If you stop the treatments too soon, they might relapse. So a rough rule of thumb is that after the first episode, you treat for six to nine months. Then if the person's continuing to do okay, if their life is okay, so you know they're not just about to take a major exam or some major other stresses, etc., then you might consider generally gradually tapering the medication, seeing how they're doing. And if they're doing fine, they stay off the medication. If they're starting to relapse, quickly come back to the medication. In people who've had more episodes, and unfortunately that's relatively common, So major depressive disorder for many people, if not most people, tends to be a chronic condition. So it's unusual that you only have one episode. Most people, unfortunately, have multiple episodes. And then you make a decision if they're having these episodes quite frequently and if the episodes are, in fact, quite impairing to their lives when you have a depression because it affects everything you're doing. It can affect your ability to have relationships. People get divorced. People start to take substances. People drop out of school, drop out of work, etc. Then what you try and do if someone you know has repeated depressions, it's much better that they just stay on the medication that's working. So just like if you're hypertensive or if you're diabetic, you wouldn't stop the antihypertensive or you wouldn't stop the diabetes medication we try and do the same thing with depression. And while any medication has side effects, to the best of our knowledge, most of these treatments have really very few long-term bad side effects. Certainly while you're on it, you can have dry mouth, you can have sexual dysfunction, you can have constipation, you can have a number of things that of course aren't pleasant, but generally speaking, you can adjust things so that those things are minimized. And to the best of our knowledge, they don't have any major long-term side effects or consequences. So the benefit of staying on them and keeping your depression at bay is much more important than stopping the medication and any side effects you may have. Oftentimes people are afraid to take medication because they're concerned that it might change their brain. But some of this brain scans that I've seen show that the brain will be changed over time with the major depressive episode and not always in a positive way. Is that correct? It's correct, and I'd say almost never in a positive way. (laughs) Unfortunately, generally, it's sort of, unfortunately, you know, brain atrophy and things that aren't good. I think what is also very important to keep in mind, as I mentioned, someone has a history of recurrent chronic depression, then staying on treatment is almost always the, the right thing to do rather than stopping the treatment. And believe me, I understand, I wouldn't, no one wants to take medication. And then I think a completely understandable concern is that, are these treatments changing my brain? Sometimes people have read some of the research that suggests that some of these treatments actually work on what we call plasticity pathways. So these are pathways in the brain that really allow the brain to grow and function and withstand different kinds of stresses, etc. So are these treatments affecting my brain? And I think the answer is very likely yes, but the 
thing to really keep in mind is that the illness itself really directly affects the brain and in a very negative way. So what we've been able to do over the years, and there's quite a bit of research on this, so in humans, we've been able to look at depressed patients with different kinds of brain imaging. There's something called PET scan, P-E-T, which stands for positron emission tomography. And in that, what you can do is you can take someone who's depressed, group of people who are depressed, and people who are age-matched controls or not depressed, and you can show in parts of the brain when someone is depressed, there is reduced activity in that part of the brain. And you can measure this activity both by the amount of blood flow that's going to this part of the brain, as well as what we call glucose utilization. So the more active your brain is, the more that part of the brain is using glucose. And you can show in people who are depressed that there's unfortunate at times a marked reduction in the blood flow or the glucose utilization. What people have then also done in post-mortem brain studies, it's one of those things that sometimes when people donate their brains for research after they pass away, we can learn some things. And there I think it's a bad news, good news picture So before I come back to that, let me just say the other kind of brain imaging is what we call MRI scans. So I'm sure most people are familiar if you've had a back injury or knee injury, you get an MRI scan. You can do the same thing with the brain. And with the MRI scan, you can really be very accurate in terms of measuring the size of a different part of the brain. So for example, people may have heard of the prefrontal cortex or the hippocampus or the amygdala. So you can actually accurately measure the size of that brain structure in depressed people compared to control people who are not depressed. And in some cases, you can also do it people who are depressed off treatment and then treatment. And what consistently these studies have shown is that the size of these brain regions is somewhat smaller in people when they're depressed. So it's not the sort of thing that if you think you might be depressed, you can go for an MRI scan and the doctor can say, aha, I can see that you're depressed based on the MRI scan. But it's when you take 100 people with depression and 100 people without depression, you can clearly see a reduction in the size of this brain region. And then when you go to post-mortem brain studies, you can see kind of a good news, bad news picture. The bad news is that even in the post-mortem brain, you can see that there is a reduction in these brain regions in terms of the number of synapses. It's almost like the neurons, these nerve cells, are a little bit shriveled up. They're shrunken, and because they've shrunken, When you do the MRI scan, you see less volume. But the good news is that it's not like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, for example, where the neurons are dead. The neurons are still alive, but they're sick and shrunken. And what we've been able to show in animal studies and increasingly in human studies is that with the right treatment, you actually seem to be able to reverse the shrinkage. So it's really important for people to keep in mind that, as I said, I think it's an understandable concern. Are these treatments affecting my brain structure? And the answer appears to be yes, but most, if not all, the evidence we have suggests that the way it's doing that is that it's correcting the deficit that the illness was causing. So it's not that your brain, your neurons are going to sprout excessively or you're going to make too many abnormal connections, etc. It's more like you're going to counter the effect of the illness. And I think almost all the evidence we have suggests that that's a good thing and that it's in fact much better than the um, consequences of remaining ill. Some people try many treatments and they seem to be what's called treatment resistant. Can you speak about that? And can you speak about some of the newer medications that are being studied and used in clinical trials and even in practice? 
I think the concept of treatment resistance is an important one. I know during this discussion, I've been coming back to many medical examples. I think that's a good thing because quite often you can understand it. Again, if we come back to something like hypertension or epilepsy, sometimes people will go on the first treatment, say a water pill for hypertension, they'll be fine. For some people, it won't be enough. Then you'll add something called a beta blocker or you'll switch to something called an ACE inhibitor, etc. So it's not unusual for many of these illnesses where it's not a one-size-fits-all and that sometimes people have to try various different things. One of the problems in depression, I think there's two, two problems. One is in, compared to something like hypertension where you can put someone on a treatment and a couple of days later measure their blood pressure and you know if it's working or not. And if it's not working well enough, you can add another treatment and measure the blood pressure again. Depression is obviously more complicated and it's really hard to just put someone on a treatment and see if it's working. So it's unfortunate that many people go through kind of a trial and error of a lot of different treatments. One of the other big problems in depression is that most of our current treatments, with one exception that I'll come to, really take four to six weeks to work. So they're not like painkillers where you have pain, you take the treatment, half an hour later you're better. These take four to six weeks to work. And so often you go on one treatment and you have to give it four to six weeks before you know if it's working, adjust the dose. And then if it's not working, then you taper off that one and then go to another one or you add something, etc. And obviously that can be fairly difficult for many people. And then the other thing that's been true until relatively recently is that although we have a lot of different antidepressants, almost all of them work by one of two mechanisms, namely they increase the levels of a neurotransmitter called serotonin or a neurotransmitter called norepinephrine. So if you've tried medications that do one or both of those things and they haven't worked, it's perhaps not surprising that if you take another medication that kind of is the same, it's not going to work. And so that's been one of the big problems in treating depression is that we haven't necessarily had many different mechanisms compared to other fields of medicine. And so a number of people have what Dr. Nash referred to as treatment-resistant depression. Sometimes as an official definition for treatment-resistant depression, we sometimes talk about people having tried and failed to respond to two different treatments where they have received the treatments at the right dose and for the right duration. As I said, you can't just try it for a week and then give up. It may have worked. So that's the situation that we call treatment-resistant depression. And unfortunately, we think that about 30% of all people with major depressive disorder fall into this category of what we call treatment-resistant depression, where they try multiple things and they try various cocktails, and then hopefully they get some benefit, but not enough. And so that leads to the newer research. So one of the things that has gotten people quite excited is the recognition that some of these plasticity pathways in the brain might be involved in depression. And what we had started to learn over years of research in rodents is that when you take a medication like an SSRI, what it does is increase the levels of serotonin in the synapse. And then the levels of serotonin start a long um, series of chemical reactions that ultimately, after several weeks, changes some of these plasticity molecules. And some of these plasticity molecules have names like NMDA or AMPA, A-M-P-A. So a lot of that research, and a lot of that research was done at the NIH when I was there, started to suggest that if you have people who haven't responded to the existing treatments, maybe there's something wrong with the multiple steps between increasing serotonin and the change in the plasticity molecule. So what if you just bypassed the serotonin? What if you went straight to the plasticity molecule, the NMDA or the AMPA? If you used a medication that directly worked on those things, would you have treatments that worked even when existing treatments hadn't worked? 
And would these treatments work rapidly? Because maybe one of the reasons that these old treatments take four to six weeks is that you've got to go through all these biochemical steps. And if you're bypassing the biochemical steps, could these treatments work rapidly? And so that led to a lot of interest in trying to use something that might target the NMDA receptor in the brain. And the animal data suggested that if you block the NMDA receptor, that might have antidepressant effect. And so at the NIH, we had started to think about what could be a good NMDA blocker that gets into the brain that is safe, that doesn't have major side effects, etc. And it was very, I think we want to give a lot of credit to some researchers at Yale who a few years ago had been using very low dose of IV ketamine. So at very low doses, ketamine blocks these NMDA receptors. And they were doing these studies to basically see what happens when you block these NMDA receptors. They weren't necessarily looking for an antidepressant response, but found that when they were giving people this low-dose ketamine, some of those people who happened to be depressed were showing an antidepressant response and were actually responding quite rapidly. And as I said, ketamine you know, works on this NMDA receptor, which really is one of these plasticity molecules that we thought would be important. So while I was at the NIH, we wanted to do a very rigorous control study. So at the NIH, we recruited patients who had what we call treatment-resistant depression. So they needed to have failed two previous antidepressant treatments. Actually, the group that came to the NIH was actually very treatment-resistant. On average, they had failed six different antidepressants. Some of them had failed electroconvulsive therapy, and they had been continuously depressed for three years when they came into the study. They were given either intravenous, low-dose intravenous ketamine or low-dose intravenous placebo. And remarkably, not only did we see an antidepressant response, but we saw the antidepressant response starting within two hours in this population that had been previously treatment-resistant. And at one day, 70% of people were classified as responders. And the definition of responder is that you've got a 50% reduction in your symptoms. And 50% of people met criteria for being in remission, which basically means now um, you don't have many symptoms. So that led to a lot of excitement in the field. Could this be a completely novel way to treat treatment-resistant depression and to also come up with a treatment that works faster? And then there were a lot of academic studies done both at the NIH, at Yale, at Harvard at other places that largely replicated these findings. Around that time, I actually left the NIH and joined J&J. And initially, my thoughts were these studies are really pointing to the right target. If we could come up with even new ways of affecting the NMDA, except we could have new treatments. But then I started to wonder, having seen some of the people who had responded to ketamine, IV ketamine, how much better they were, was there a way we could actually even make the ketamine molecule a really safe, effective FDA and European regulator approved treatment? My hypothesis was that one of the reasons it seemed to work so well is that it gets into the brain very quickly. When you take an oral medication, it basically has to go to the stomach and get digested and get into the bloodstream. And then a little gets to the brain and the brain might adapt to it. And a little more gets to the brain and the brain might adapt to it, etc. Whereas it, with the IV formulation, it reaches the brain, the NMDA receptors in the brain rapidly and turns on these plasticity pathways. So I had thought we need to do something that isn't an oral medication. Clearly, IV is complicated. You have to go to a clinical setting where you have to have an IV and with IV ketamine in many places you need to have an anesthesiologist present, etc. It's not going to be as accessible. But I had thought that intranasal might be a way to rapidly get the drug to the brain. If you've sort of taken a decongestant or something like that, a nose spray, you know that can only deliver a small amount of drug through the spray. 
So you can't deliver a lot of drug to the spray mechanism. So then we started to look at the ketamine molecule, and many molecules come in two versions, an R version and an S version. And sometimes the R and the S versions have different properties. And what we were able to figure out was that the S version was actually three to four times more potent at the NMDA receptor. And so in principle, you could make an intranasal version of the S ketamine, and only a small amount of it would be needed to get into the brain to bring about an antidepressant effect. And because you're using a small amount of it, you would theoretically even have fewer side effects, etc. So we basically conducted a series of studies. The first question was, does S ketamine actually work? Then the question was, how rapidly does it work? Does it get people better? And obviously, since we've mentioned already, depression, unfortunately, for many people, is a chronic condition. So does it keep people better? And then are there specific side effects you need to worry about, etc.? So we conducted a whole series of studies that took about eight years of very hard work. We were able to show that in treatment-resistant depression, you had a robust and rapid response to intranasal esketamine. Most of the effects were seen actually within 24 hours, and that with repeated administration, you could maintain the effects. So the paradigm we designed and tested was that for the first four weeks, you get it twice a week, and then after the first four weeks, you get it administered basically according to what you need. So some people might need it once a week. Some people might need it once every two weeks. Some people might need it once every three weeks. And we found that with this sort of administration paradigm, we could maintain people with treatment-resistant depression well over the course of several years. And we were very pleased, obviously, to be able to help people with depression and keep them well. We did studies with more than 1,800 people to sort of look for any long-term safety signals, and we had no long-term safety problems. Like every medication, you do have side effects, and there's probably two that we should make sure your audience is aware of. The first one is that once you take the medication, after about 40 to 45 minutes, most people will have somewhat of a blood pressure increase. And the blood pressure increase is the amount that any of us might have if we undertook some exercise. Then the blood pressure very quickly comes down, so about by an hour and a half it's gone. And then your blood pressure remains fine until the next time you get a dose, which might be later in the week or after two weeks or after three weeks. And once again, you have a, a small increase in blood pressure that lasts about 45 minutes. The second side effect that occurs is what you know many people may have heard of, this thing called dissociation. So dissociation is some of those symptoms that people might feel that they don't feel real or the room doesn't feel real. Colors might seem brighter, sounds might seem louder, etc. And that, once again, occurs usually within about 45 minutes and then is gone within about an hour and a half. What we've tried to do is we've tried to be very thoughtful so we don't want people to go home with the medication. You come to some sort of clinic setting, you administer the medication yourself, then you stay there for a while afterwards, about two hours in total, while someone you know, monitors your blood pressure and checks your dissociation. And once you're fine, then you go home. And what we've also decided, although this very low dose as ketamine has very low addictive potential compared to what you've heard about special K, high doses that gets used in the club, etc. We really don't want anyone to abuse the drug. So you basically don't go home with the drug. It's administered in an intranasal device that only has the exact amount of the drug so that once you administer the drug, the device is empty. And as I said, you have to go to a site that has been certified. The site has to make sure that the, only the right amount was dosed, etc. So we've tried to be very thoughtful about preventing abuse liability, helping people, and managing side effects. So this is one of the things that is now available, and hopefully many people would benefit. I think what I'd also like to say is that these findings have really also re-energized the field because it's not only helping people. It's also helped people to realize that there are, in fact, novel ways to treat depression. 
that will work in what we call treatment-resistant depression, it will work faster, etc. And so now there's a flurry of research going on to come up with even more ways. I'll just mention a couple. One of the ways is to recognize that depression basically arises because you have some of these plasticity changes in different circuits of the brain. So you have certain brain circuits that might affect your ability to experience pleasure, motivation. You might have circuits that make you hyper-aroused and agitated and having ruminations and not sleeping, etc. So we've been able to understand what some of these brain circuits are, and then we've also been able to understand specific molecules which can normalize those circuits. And so now there's a lot of research that's going into a slightly more personalized medicine approach. So if you're someone who has a depression that's characterized by some specific symptoms where some specific circuits might need to be regulated, then you get a certain kind of treatment. Where if you're someone who has a different kind of pattern, where maybe you're just overly agitated, you can't sleep, you're ruminating, etc., and you get a different kind of treatment. And hopefully in the coming years, we'll have several of those. The last research area I'll just mention quickly is this area of what we call neuroimmune interactions. So what we're learning is that when someone is depressed, they have a lot of physical symptoms. And if you have depression, you're more at risk for cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, osteoporosis. And we've learned that it's because many people with depression have an abnormal activation of the immune system. And then people started to wonder, in some people, could the immune system also be driving the depression? And there's reasons to believe that because, for example, in people, if you give them this immune agent called interferon, about 30 to 40 percent of people will become depressed. So there's now there's a lot of research to try and see whether you can work on those immune modulators and might they not only treat the depression, but also treat the physical manifestations that some people have. And once again, it'll probably be a personalized medicine. You won't take everyone who's depressed and then give them an immune treatment. You'll measure the specific immune changes in some people And if you're one of those people who has changes in a specific immune molecule, then you might benefit from this treatment. So I think it's reasons for your audience to be optimistic that although the field of depression hasn't had a lot of progress until recently, now I think both with esketamine and other things that are coming out, there's reasons to be optimistic that we're going to see far more progress. And I think this goes to the point of how it's important that clinicians who are treating people with major depressive disorder are trained in the most up-to-date treatments for their patients. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And I can't emphasize that enough that many people, it's, it's not surprising that when you, one of us train, you might have only been trained in certain treatments, et cetera. And then especially when you're a practicing clinician, I think very highly of a lot of our practicing clinicians, et cetera, but it's just sometimes difficult to be kept up to all the latest findings, et cetera. So I do think it's a very good point Dr. Nash brings up. It's important for the treating team to be aware. And that's why sometimes, even if you've got a great treating team, sometimes getting a consultation that is specialized, there are some places that have specialized treatment resistant depression centers. They quite often they're associated with universities, et cetera. Sometimes it's not as easy, but if you're struggling, even though you have a great team, Some of these experimental treatments, especially often the academic centers which specialize in it, might know about it. And if you go for a consultation, then you might get some additional recommendations that perhaps will help you. So what are you most excited about in mental health treatment today? I think I'm most excited about a couple of things. I'd say one is the actual science. Now, I think people have recognized for a long time it's so true that the brain and the mind is the most complex thing in the universe, so it's not been easy. But I think thanks to the hard work and dedication of a lot of researchers, we're starting to realize a lot of the fundamental aspects of these conditions. And so once we know more, we can come up with better treatments, some of those identified. I think we're also recognizing that a lot of what I talked about, like these plasticity molecules, etc., we also are really coming to appreciate that 
we're talking about people who have lives. We're not talking about a nerve cell and a test tube. So while the plasticity pathway might be important, we need to think more about holistic approaches to people's well-being. And it's interesting that you're in medicine some years ago. That was the way you thought about it. You put the person at the center, and then you thought about what are the best ways to help them. Some of it might be medication. Some of it might be other things, etc. Unfortunately, as you know, sort of society has progressed, it's become a little bit more fragmented. But I see a real desire for people to come back to that model, where certainly you need the treatments, you know, biological treatments, etc. But you need to think about some of these other things that will help and keep people better and give people a lot back. And then one of the things most optimistic about, and it's one of the things we need to really collectively your whole audience, you, me, everyone, we need to take on together is this area of stigma. So I think it's absolutely unacceptable to me that these are real illnesses that have a huge impact on people and yet some parts of society don't quite recognize it and there's stigma and shame associated with these illnesses and there's absolutely should not be. And there's so many people who don't get the treatment they deserve or people who wait and wait and wait because of the stigma. The thing I'm optimistic about, I think our younger generation is so much more open and so much more willing to acknowledge that there's nothing wrong. Just like, you know, there's nothing wrong with having physical illness. There's nothing wrong with having a mental illness. And there should be no stigma or shame. And they're demanding that people pay attention to mental illness. And our young people are so socially connected. I think even the fact that we're doing a podcast right now, it reaches millions of people across the world. So the social connectedness is something that we can all also take advantage of. I really want to thank you and acknowledge the tremendous work you're doing, Dr. Nash, with this podcast series. Sometimes these illnesses are misunderstood. By having these sorts of sessions, we can demystify them. We can let people know that these illnesses aren't their fault. We can help their family members know that these are illnesses that can and will get better, but they need care and compassion. And we can all work together to change the mindset within society so that there's the adequate parity for mental health care like there is for physical care, that employers are cognizant that mental health should be given the same sort of attention as physical health, that with our millennials who care so much more about mental health, if you're an employer who wants to attract the best millennials to your company, if you're someone who has a progressive attitude towards mental health, you'll have people wanting to come work for you, etc. So I think I'm excited both about the research science, but also about the awareness that's going on about mental illness. We've got a long way to go, but I'm optimistic that if we work together, we can make a real difference for all our loved ones and for society as a whole. So if you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about mental health treatment today, what would it be? I think it would actually be one of those last things we talked about. I think it may surprise people, but This area of stigma affects everything. So when people have stigma towards mental health conditions, you don't realize how bad these conditions are. So just to give you a few statistics, so the World Health Organization has identified mental illnesses as the most disabling conditions in the world. So that's something that is eye-opening to most people. The World Economic Forum has recognized that mental illnesses alone are going to cost society more than cancer, diabetes, and respiratory diseases combined. So if we can raise awareness and reduce stigma, not only do we get people the treatment and care they deserve, but if you look at, for example, how much funding goes towards something like cancer or heart disease or something compared to mental illness, mental illness, despite being so much more complex, doesn't get what it really needs. And I think it's just a reality that the more research funding we have, the more world's best people we recruit to go into research in mental illness, the more successful we'll be at coming up with even better treatments. And so by raising awareness and stigma, we can also enlighten different politicians and people who are making decisions about where to invest resources, that mental health, if you take care of mental health, you really have an impact on society in terms of physical health, academic, scholastic, interpersonal, all those things. 
So that's one of the things I think we got to do t- together is raise awareness so that we can tackle mental health together and the rewards will come from that. I completely agree. So Dr. Mandy, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you've helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand the fields of major depressive disorders. Thank you, Dr. Nash. It's really been my pleasure and I really wish your audience the best wishes. And as I said, if unfortunately you're struggling or know someone who's struggling, make sure they reach out and get the treatment they deserve. Thank you again very much. So be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health, including a page dedicated to major depressive disorder and Dr. Manchi's work. There you will also find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There's no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want. 